New York, London and Toronto listed Wheaton Precious Metals is one of the largest precious metals companies in the world. It's a streaming business as well. Indeed, Silver Wheaton, as it was, invented the concept of streaming, where agreements are made to purchase all or a portion of a commodity for an upfront payment and further payments on delivery. Wheaton currently has streaming agreements for 23 operating mines and 13 development stage projects. I think there's a few on the way as well. Let's get some more now with Randy Smallwood, uh, Wheaton Precious Metals President and Chief Executive. Good to talk to you. Thanks indeed for- Jeremy, very good to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you in London uh, as much as anything else. I know you're here to, uh, to press the flesh with some uh, some contacts, but it's good to have you pass by the studio. But first of all, I want to get this idea about this streaming thing uh, to clarify exactly what it is. You've been in the business at Wheaton since it all started. So you are really the original streamer, I think you and your yes. team. Yes, exactly. Yeah. How did no. you set it all up? What was the idea? Well, the whole concept was there's a lot of, uh, of gold and silver production that is produced as byproducts from copper mines, from lead zinc mines. In fact, most silver actually comes from lead zinc mines. It doesn't come from silver mines. And so there was, you know, the, the original focus was on silver because we recognized that over 70% of silver doesn't come from silver mines. And so silver investors weren't getting access to that silver as, a, as, as an investable uh, production. And so we created the streaming model to try and, and, and approach base metal mining companies, the lead zinc mining companies of the world, to stream off their silver, to pay them up front for the rights to purchase whatever a portion of their silver production for the life of the mine going forward. The huge advantage to us and our shareholders is that our costs are fixed. There's no, uh, the upfront payment is defined by the contract and the production payment when they deliver silver to us was, was, is also defined by the contract and fixed and not subject to inflation. Uh, back in about 2010, 2011, we decided to expand into the gold space. And so hence the name Wheaton Precious Metals now mm. instead of Silver Wheaton. And we do the same thing. And, and in fact, a lot of gold around the world gets produced as byproducts from copper mines. And so one of our niche uh, ex areas of expertise is going to these copper mining companies and again, supplying capital for them to help them grow their company and focus on their copper production by purchasing a percentage of the gold production from these copper mines. And that gets delivered to us. And when it does, we make a fixed production payment, typically around $400 per ounce for gold. Well, you can see with gold at $1,700 yeah. plus per ounce right now, we're an incredibly profitable company. Just, just want to pick up on the word fixed. Fixed for how long? For what period? For the life of the mine, it is defined. Now, typically what we have in most of our agreements are $400 per ounce, and then in a fourth year, a 1% kicker. So it climbs by 1%. But that 1% is fixed. That's not referenced to any inflation indicators. So in year four, it'll be $404. In year eight, it'll be $408 and, and, and some cents, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So it does have a, a, an accelerator, a climber, but it's only at 1% rate, which is of course, well below uh, <laughs> the inflation rates we're seeing around the world. New contracts now, we, we actually uh, now define it as being a percentage of the spot price. And so for gold, new contracts now, typically 20% of the spot price. So for a, a new contract that we sign, uh, one of the more recent ones here, with gold at $1,700 an ounce, we are paying $340 per ounce of gold that gets delivered to us. Again, a very healthy profit margin, 80%, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, so do you get approached to 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 get these to, to to sell these assets? I mean, because it's it seems to me like you've locked in a tremendous opportunity. First, you've got the visibility. Mm -hmm. Second, is you've got enormous opportunity here, given the price differential between when you first negotiated the deals at four hundred dollars oh. and where the price is now. I mean, it must surely put a lot of pressure That's... on you to retain the assets and make sure they stay on the books, rather than get the temptation to sell them on to someone else. It, might want to it all depends. Everything off. everything has a value, sure. uh, and so and in fact we. You know, we recently did uh, um, sell back two streams to to some of our partners, right. more because the uh, the value that was being offered was better than what we saw coming out of the asset. Yeah. So everything has a value, and and we do manage our portfolio. And we're not just paid to make new acquisitions. We also manage our existing portfolio. And if we see better value in terms of collapsing a stream or adjusting a stream, we will always try and unlock that value. But you're right. Uh, our objective is to gain long term exposure to mines that have good exploration potential, good expansion potential, because these are life of mine agreements. Um, our current reserve and resource base, uh, high confidence reserves and resources, which is measured and indicated and proven and probable reserves, 40 years. 
We've got 40 years in our company and we've got another 20 years of inferred resources. So we've got mm. 60 years combined reserves, high confidence and lower confidence reserves and resources in the company. We've been able to build up an incredible asset base that has now given us such a strong foundation. We just continue mm. to grow. Are you happy with where you are at the moment? I'm talking about this in the context of where you were started back in 2002, I think it was, when you were at Gold Corp, when I think you and some colleagues got together and Gold Corp then spun off. As I said, what was, I think, then Silver Wheaton, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Um, are you happy with where you are? Have you done your job? Are you satisfied that you've reached your target? Or what's the point of target now, where you are now here in 2022? Well, I sit and think about where the market was back then in terms of supplying capital for these type of agreements. And there's always been royalty structures beforehand. You know, they're, they're more historical. But royalties, there was a lot of disadvantages to royalties. And, and streaming really unlocked that. And so I think... I am happy because we've changed the entire industry from this segment. And even the traditional royalty companies now don't do royalties. They do streams. The Franco Nevadas, the Royal Golds, the bulk of their net asset value is tied to streaming agreements, not to royalties. Did anymore. you get a rake off of that? This I have no idea. Yeah, I should have, should, have got a, should have got a stream on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the other thing that we've done is we've really elevated the involvement. And that's, that's what I've always said. One of the big advantages of a stream is that it's a contractual partnership, an agreement a partnership with the operator. And we're constantly in discussions with them. We visit the assets on a very regular, at least once a year, on a very regular basis. We help them. That We have this overlying belief in our company that the stronger our partners are, the stronger we are. So we do everything we can to help our partners be more successful. And, and I think one of the areas I'm most proud of is the efforts that we've made. Traditionally, royalty companies were sort of silent partners in the back and, and they just collected the check every quarter, but they never contributed anything back to the success of the operation or to the social license. And one of the areas that we've had great success is bringing all those traditional royalty companies into the point where we're now part of the success and making sure that other stakeholders get benefits from these mine sites. We have strong community reinvestment programs yeah. to make sure that we leave sustainable benefits in place. We're constantly working with our partners and technical ambassador programs where we're trying to make sure that they're taking advantage of the best and latest technology in terms of uh, power consumption in terms of efficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. And so truly more of a partnership with the operators than, than traditional. I want to get more into the ESG side of it in just a few moments' time if I can, but I just wanted to one last question on the streaming side. How did streaming stand up to the, the great financial crisis and also um, the COVID pandemic? Now, we know the price of gold raised, and we'll take a look at the share price in just a minute. We know the price mm -hmm. of gold rose to over $2,000 uh, per ounce uh, in the COVID, following on the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. which obviously benefited mm -hmm. from. Does the streaming model, did it stand up well to the financial crisis? And Very well, because our cost base is so low. Yeah. And so we can have crises come through and, and impact the operators. But, you know, uh, the one thing that I would say that we at Wheaton have really differentiated ourselves is we're really focused on asset quality. We want the assets to, to have strong operating margins for all of the stakeholders, including us. But I'll tell you right now, if the operator is not making money at the mine, the mine will not operate. And so we need to make sure that the operator is also profitable. And I will say that if the communities around the mine site aren't getting benefits from those mines, the mine will not operate. Eventually, it will not operate. And so we need to make sure that that's all the place. And we've been very, very selective about what we invest into because we want to make sure that we have good, strong, healthy operating margins for all of the stakeholders. And what that does is it provides a cushion when we have pandemics, when we have global financial crisis. And so, and then typically what happens in those type of environments is, of course, the commodity price, gold and precious metals, uh, it's, it's, a, you know, it's the fear factor that feeds into it. And, and we see a kick up in prices and we are perfectly positioned to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And so, so we've done very well through, through all those, both of those. One look at shoes. Yeah, sure. Uh, one look at the balance sheet. It's clear you've got enough money to be going on with. You don't have to, to, to raise money. So uh, what are you doing with that money on the balance sheet. I said at the top, you've got uh, streaming agreements of 23 operating mines and 13 development stage projects. Just before you went to air, mm -hmm. I think um, you corrected me. I think there's a little bit more in the pipeline coming. Is that right? Well, definitely. We, I mean, these development projects are ones that are in construction or getting ready to start construction. We've had a very busy, in fact, the pandemic was very good for us. Uh, we, we closed eight different transactions over about a year and a half in terms of adding new projects coming on stream. Only one of those was operating. The other seven are, are projects that are in construction or going into construction shortly. And so, so our growth profile over the next four years is without parallel in the industry. We're, we're currently going to be producing somewhere around 660, 670,000 gold equivalent ounces this year. Um, 
we should see the high side of 900,000 ounces per year uh, within four or five years. Um, very good, strong growth profile with a number of projects that are coming on stream over the next few years to deliver going forward. Now, what do we do with our capital? Some of that's going to help fund that because when we sign these agreements, we co-fund the construction. We provide a, a fixed amount of capital to help these companies build the mines as they come into into stream. The other thing, of course, is we have a good, healthy dividend. Thirty percent of our cash flow does go back to our shareholders, to uh, you know, to help offset and provide more benefit back to the shareholders. Um, the our focus is to continue to look for good, high quality assets to continue growing the portfolio going forward. And um, and we still see lots of opportunity. We are blessed with an industry that always needs capital. The mining industry is a very capital hungry industry. We supply capital to the mining industry. And so, but we get the benefits of getting that good commodity exposure, expansion, expect, exploration, exposure yeah. all the way through that. And so, talk a little bit more about the register as well as I can if I, before I go into other things. Um, you've got an A list investment companies on, on your register. You've got, you've got Vanguard, BlackRock, Fidelity, Van Eck. I mean, there's all sorts of names that I recognize from the industry, uh, but none of them is a really big hold. I think the biggest is about four and a quarter percent or something, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. um, are they all supportive? Do they keep poking you? We want more, we want more, or they just let you get on with it? Um, you know, we've delivered close to 20% returns on, uh, on, on, on up to our investors over the life of the company. Right. So they're pretty happy shareholders, yeah. um, and, and they've been there all the way through. Uh, you know, those all the companies you listed have been investors in the company back when we created it back in 2004. Right. Uh, they were there early and they've they've been very, very supportive. Again, it comes down to delivering, uh, making sure that you are delivering uh, good, strong results. They, like everyone, recognizes that we are subject to commodity price fluctuations. The biggest factor in terms of our share price is what is the price of gold doing and what is the price of silver doing. Um, and so they recognize that sometimes we do have downs, but typically that also creates opportunities for us. It's the best time for us to buy and invest into. And we've got a good, strong balance sheet right now with... with uh, Probably close to three hundred million dollars in, or sorry, close to three billion dollars in liquidity, or, you know, capital available that we can actually put to work. And with a bit of a weaker commodity price, we're hoping to close some transactions. It's always the best time to buy. Well, yeah. Look, <laughs> let's 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 talk about the context of the capital chance. Uh, let's talk about spot gold first of all, because you talk about that in the context of what's happened, where the company is, and so forth. If we go back, uh, you can see uh, clearly here the highs that we had. Uh, back in July 2020, when we saw the post-COVID lockdown highs that we had in the price of gold. And I know we'll come onto a share price in just a minute, which benefited from that. Since then, we've seen this pullback in the price of gold. But we've got to mention the fact this is gold in dollars. You're here in exactly. London. We were talking about this before we went to air again, about the fact that us using sterling, it's actually a very different story. Yeah, well, very much so. Um, that's the key, is that what we've seen over the last while is incredible strength in the American dollar. How sustainable is that? I think we all have to ask ourselves that. How sustainable is that? that faith in the in the American dollar relative to other currencies. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that when you look at the price of gold in sterling or euros or Canadian dollars, even mm -hmm. Canadian dollars, although we do uh, do you know do follow the US dollar quite a bit, but uh, when you look at gold in, in other currencies around the world, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's clear how important it's becoming as sort of a, it's a store of value relative to fiat currencies. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that has become incredibly apparent over the last uh, couple of, well, I would say last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Let's bring up a share price chart. Now, this is the US. This is the New York listed one. So it doesn't have today's uh, moves yet on it because we're so early in the day uh, mm -hmm. compared to where US markets start. But uh, closing out uh, yesterday, just above the $30 level, I think this is about $14 billion worth of market cap. Mm -hmm. You've got when you're looking at the US listing. What do you say to people when you're looking at the share price chart? You've dipped below some areas of interesting support. And in fact, I think recently hitting levels not seen since 9th of April 2020. It must be very difficult for you as a chief executive to see this. It's explained away in part by the price of gold. Uh, largely. But, yes. but on the other hand, mm -hmm. this represents something from what you've also been talking about in terms of your visibility, in terms of profitability, mm -hmm. the amount of money you've got in the balance sheet, what you're doing with the money, and how you're trying to grow the company. Does this represent much of what you're doing at the moment? No, it doesn't. It doesn't capture the, the growth profile that we've got coming up over the next four or five years. It doesn't capture how inflation-proof our company is. Yeah. That's, the, that's the key thing that I really encourage everyone to understand, that the difference between a streaming company and a mining company or just buying in bullion, right? A streaming company still gives you all the benefits of a good quality mining investment, but you don't have the cost risk. And cost risk, capital cost risk, operating cost risk, that has been the nemesis of mining companies forever. 
forever. It's been a continual challenge. With a streaming company, you don't have that exposure. And in fact, because we have that production payment, you actually get leveraged exposure to the commodity price itself. So for, if we see commodity prices jump 50%, we actually, our, our cash flows jump 65%, right? And so that leveraged exposure, plus the lack of cost risk in terms of the capital cost up front and the fixed production payments going forward, incredibly attractive in an inflationary environment, especially when you consider that the inflationary environment, what does that equal? That means that your, your pound sterling isn't going to buy what it bought a year ago. Yeah, yeah. Your US dollar isn't going to buy what it bought a year ago. Gold will stand it's through this. Yes, yeah. as protection. And so I think everyone needs to have some precious metals in their portfolio. And I don't know of a better way to, to provide that, that exposure, that, that, that ownership of precious metals than a streaming company like Wheaton. But it has to be said, though, in all fairness, your costs are going up as well. You talk about inflation. You've got inflation presumably on staff costs, on, on, on raw material costs, whatever you have in terms of, um, I don't know, diesel, whatever it is you drive your business with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and then, of course, we talk about ESG as well, which is also adding an extra cost, isn't it, to the overall uh, cost base that you're having to deal with. Uh, how, what do you say about costs in the current environment? Well, uh, we're a $14 billion company that has 40 employees. Um, we're a very well, yeah, small Actually, company. we didn't get onto that. that yeah. I think is so our, our G&A costs yeah, are incredibly... That's, that's Once these streams are in place, yeah, there's very, very little exposure. Our G&A costs are very small on a relative basis. But you're paying the and operators, so, though. The operators presumably have a cost that they have to handle. Well, yeah, but it's a fixed cost. We're paying uh, that $400 right, okay. per ounce. Back to what you're and talking so about, our actually. costs, our only costs, the bulk of our costs Home. are yeah, yeah are, are tied yeah. to the ounce itself. And so the G&A, um, you know, it's, it's literally 40 yeah. employees. I, yeah. I love it because here I am yeah. running this company. I know everyone Everyone's employed. I know, I know the wives and I know the kids' names. It's, it's a, I'm trying it's to think of what else company. to ask you to try and get us to dig down to find out more about. But, but you've explained it beautifully. And indeed, that's exactly the point to be made about the fact your, your, your costs remain as they are. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me just quickly get back to ESG and talk a little bit more about this. Mm -hmm. you, you touched upon it uh, and the responsibility for company um, uh, wheat and size to engage with the local communities, yep. uh, to make sure that the payback is there. Um, and of course, there's the environmental thing as well about getting this stuff out of the ground. How important is it to you to engage with operators that ensure that they run as many renewables as possible and trying to find a way to get carbon neutral uh, oh. to get to the end product? It's, it's uh, you know, I'm going to say, and, and, you know, a bit of background about myself. I'm a geological yeah. engineer that came from the mining industry. I operated, I, I had the benefit of finding a, a small but very profitable or being part of a discovery team in a small but very profitable gold mine in Northern Canada. And we actually brought it into production, ran it successfully for, for many years. Um, social license has always been there. Uh, mm -hmm. Companies, you know, and, and, and so, you know, making sure that you're leaving a sustainable benefit to the communities around you that are allowing you to come into their, their areas, their, mm -hmm. their, their zones, their territories, their lands, and making sure that you leave good, strong benefits that will make a difference on the long term is incredibly important. And so, so it was easy for me when I, when I took over as CEO in 2011 of, of Wheat and Precious Metals, to implement a program that started providing that support. And again, the overlying mantra in our company is the stronger our partners are, the stronger we are. If our partners are incredibly profitable, that means they're gonna make money and invest back into these mines and expand them and spend money in exploration. We get the benefit of that. And so, so the more successful they are, the more successful we are. And so in 2011, uh, over 10 years ago, we kicked off the first ever campaign where, where as a streaming slash royalty company, we're actually co-funding programs with our partners to try and make sure that they have stronger social license, stronger programs to make sure we leave good, strong, sustainable benefits. And, and, and so we've now grown that into the point where the entire industry now has to do that. All the traditional royalty companies are now following suit with this, which is, that's a great thing for the mining industry and in the, in the fact that we are now providing extra capacity for our, for our operators to be, stronger and better and leave more benefits with the local communities in terms of education, healthcare, infrastructure, um, um, uh, um, employment, agricultural initiatives, uh, employment initiatives and such. So, so that was, you know, we've made good strides there. Over the last few years, we've expanded that into, and in fact, we, are, we announced earlier this year, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's an environmental fund where we're trying to focus now on helping our partners make better decisions mm -hmm. with respect to where do they source their power from? Uh, can we electrify these, this fleet? 
Um, you know, is there is there is there options to try and improve um, you know how, how uh, a product gets produced, etc., and stuff like this. And so we've now set aside a, an additional fund over and above our 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 social license fund, or to focus more on the environment and try and again. Uh, strive towards net carbon zero um, and help our partners. Now, the interesting thing about the mining industry is that, you know, it really does come down to where do you get your energy from? Are you part of a grid? Now, unfortunately, most mines are in rural locations, remote locations. It typically means you need to generate the power. Typically, I hate to say it, by either uh, diesel or, or even in some cases, coal-fired. We don't have any operations that are coal-fired, but we know some of our, our peers have operations that are, have coal-fired generators that supply the power. Very, very costly from an environmental perspective, from a carbon perspective. We have the advantage of providing funding when these mines are getting built, when new mines are getting built. We're, we're the company that comes in and supplies some of that capital. So. So what we've set aside now is a fund that is that is going to strive to help our partners make better decisions. Instead of bringing in the diesel generators, can we do a run a river hydro project? Is you know it, it does take more money up front because that's more more capital intensive than just buying generators and sticking them in place. Mm. But the long term benefits are not only from a carbon based perspective, but the operating power power cost from a run a river hydroelectric project is much lower, and that dramatically reduces the cost of operating the mine, makes the mine more profitable, means it will last longer, deliver better benefits to all the other stakeholders. So, can we help them make those kind of decisions on a go forward basis? And so, so we just announced that that fund earlier on this year, and we're going to set aside a certain amount of our cash flow every year. I think it's one or one and a half percent of our cash flow every year that will build up towards making investments with our partners to try and help them make better decisions to again strive towards net zero. Look, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We've got to wrap it up, unfortunately. I just wanted to touch on one final thing, and that is the current market environment. Um, we, we've spoken about the drop in the price of gold aligned to this move up in the dollar, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which has been a bit of a sort of a headwind in terms of share price and so forth because it's followed the price of gold. Um, how do you see things developing? Uh, we, we've got a problem in the bond markets. We've got a problem in the global economy looking like it's going to develop possibly. Geopolitics, you know, mm. I don't want to get too much detail about any of those particular subjects. Right. But how do all these potential headwinds affect you at Wheaton Precious Metals. Well, I, opportunities? Of course, opportunities, but with our existing asset portfolio, even if we see a kick up in commodity prices, it might reduce the amount of opportunities because no. because you know uh, the prices will be too high, it'll be too expensive for us, but but then we get the benefit of, of reaping uh, the harvest from our existing portfolio, which is uh, stronger cash flow. I mean, uh, when I look around the world, I'm, I'm surprised that gold is trading where it is. I think it should be trading much higher than where it is. Um, it is the only store of value that competes with the U.S. dollar, and uh, and and I think that's been really highlighted, and and it's it's when you start looking at a lot of the other currencies, the other fiat currencies around the world, and the challenges they have, especially with, you know, and this is one of the areas that I think is going to be the next sort of blow up is is U.S. dollar denominated com 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 or country debt, right? Yeah. Other countries, smaller developing economies that have U.S. dollar denominated debt, and as the U.S. dollar continues to get strength, stronger and stronger, you're going to see additional challenges in those jurisdictions. And so, I, I really think that you know everyone should look at their own portfolio, their own asset base, and make sure that they have some exposure to precious metals because it's the only way you're going to protect yourself against those kind of risks. And and as we've seen around the world, there's there's a lot of risks on the on the on on the on the government side with respect to fiat currencies and the, and the balance sheets of, of economies around the world. Well, look, it's a pleasure. So thanks, thanks indeed for popping by. Jeremy, a it's real pleasure. Been, Thank it's you. It's been great to, to speak to you. That's Randy Smallwood. He's uh, Chief Executive and President of Wheaton Precious Metals.